One of the great U.S. companies that led out in the information revolution was IBM, and it was headed by a man named Watson. His father had founded the company, and now the son came to the helm and led for a couple of decades, and he's renowned as a wonderful leader of men and women. And there was an incident that illustrates his great leadership. It occurred with a young executive, a junior executive, and he had made a series of decisions that ended up costing IBM millions of dollars. And so he got called in to the CEO's office. And so the young executive comes in, and of course he's nervous, and uh, he stands in front of Mr. Watson and he says, uh, I'm sorry that I made that series of mistakes. I, I presume you've brought me in here to fire me. Watson replies, fire you? We just spent millions of dollars educating you. Now what that means is this. Sometimes we learn the most from the failures we experience. And Watson knew well this truth. Failure is not final. If I ask for a show of hands here, how many of you would, and I'm not asking you to raise your hands, but if I were to ask for a show of hands, how many of you have failed at something in your life? I know that all of us universally would have to lift our hands up. We failed academically, we failed in sports, extracurricular activities, and most of all, we failed spiritually. But I've come here today with good news, and here it is. Failure is not final. You say, prove it to me, preacher. Glad you asked. Take your Bible, please, and let's open to the Gospel of John. And I want you, as a sign of your respect and hunger for God's Word, to please stand. We're going to read from the 18th chapter. If you're visiting us today, I'll let you know that we're actually in a series of messages through the latter half of the Gospel of John, and we're calling this series The Final Word. Jesus, who is God's final word to us, his final revelation, revelation, gave to us some important teachings there in the last hours of his life, and that's where we are in this series. Today, specifically, we come to chapter 18. And I want to begin reading in verse 15, and I'm going to skip a little bit, so hang with me. Let's begin in verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that second disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I'm not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Now skip down please to verse 25. John 18 verse 25. Now Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, now this is for a second time, and he said, I'm not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Let's bow our heads to pray. Father, how we praise you that the victory's won and we can be forgiven forever because of what Jesus has accomplished. Thank you that because of his victory, our failures are not final and we're not condemned to the dustbin of history and to our failings, but instead you have a future and a hope for every one of us. Oh God, help us to awaken to this truth that our failures need not be final, but that in you, Our future is bright. Teach us this truth. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's be seated. Failure is not final. 
And all of us have failed. So this message ought to be a great encouragement to us. Now, the proof of my premise is in the life of Peter. Peter failed. Oh, he failed. But his failure was not his final chapter. And so what we're going to do is we're going to trace the life of Peter. And I'm going to do so in four different scenes. The first scene is what I'm going to call Peter's dangerous confidence. Peter's dangerous confidence. Now, I I hope that that title strikes you as a little bit odd. (laughs) Dangerous confidence confidence. Because we're taught in our culture to be confident. But is there danger in confidence? Or I could ask it another way. Is confidence good, a good thing, or a bad thing? Is confidence a good thing or a bad thing? And I'll answer my own question. It depends based upon in whom you have your confidence whether it's good or bad. If you have your confidence in yourself, it's dangerous. But if you have put your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has accomplished for us, it is a good thing to to have confidence and trust in Him. Now we learn this from Peter's life. Peter uh, had confidence. Oh yes, he did. He was cocksure. I mean, he he had bravado. He had, we would say in our day, he had swag. Peter did. Now I want to demonstrate this from the Bible. If you look in Matthew chapter 26, which is a companion chapter, it says that uh, on that last night, the night where we are in our story, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Could I just translate that into modern day English? Jesus said, y'all are all going to deny me. And Peter said, those chumps, yeah, right, they will, but not me, Lord. You can count on me. I got this. Peter had confidence. But the danger was, Peter's confidence was not in the Lord. Peter's confidence was in his flesh, in his own strength. Why do you think he whipped out that sword the night they came to arrest Jesus? It's because he had confidence in his own strength. And his own ability. What a danger this is. You know, Peter's problem was twofold. It's like two sides of the same coin. Listen, Peter bragged too much and listened too little. He bragged too much and he listened too little. Jesus said, you're going to deny me. Peter said, no, I ain't. He said, you're going you're gonna to fall away. No, I won't. Third time, Jesus said, you're going to deny me. Peter said, no. Nope. He bragged too much. He had too much confidence in himself, and he listened too little. Oh, that he would have listened to the words of Jesus and been instructed by them, but he didn't. I'm telling you guys, overconfidence is a dangerous thing. I'll just illustrate this. A contemporary, and I mean very contemporary illustration. Are y'all following March Madness? Basketball is, is my favorite sport. I love basketball growing up especially. And March is the month when we have our National Collegiate Basketball Tournament. 64 teams ultimately get into the tournament, and they pair these teams according to what they call a seeding. The number one seeds are the top teams, and the 16th seeds are the lowest ranked teams. Well, the number one ranked team going into the tournament this year was the University of Virginia, Uh, The Cavaliers, and I have a soft place in my heart for the Cavaliers. I lived in Virginia for more than a decade, and and I've been to Charlottesville many times. I've been to some games there, and so I I follow the Cavaliers at a distance. They were the number one team, and they deserve that number one ranking. They play in the toughest basketball conference in the nation, and no, that's not the SEC. It's the ACC, and it's got the Blue Bloods like Duke and North Carolina. They're all in Virginia's conference. And Virginia won the regular season. They went 17 and 1, the best record. Then they went to the conference tournament. They won the ACC tournament. Now they're going into the NCAA tournament. They're picked to be the favorites. Now they're going to play a 16th seed. Now those are the scrubs. Those are the, those are the poorest teams. And they happen to be matched against 
And I want to chuckle uh, when I just think about it. They were matched against UMBC. You're like, man, what's the UMBC? I wouldn't have known myself. Is that the University of Missouri, the University of Mississippi, <laughs> University of Massachusetts? No, UMBC is the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. So they're going to they're gonna go up against the Goliath, Virginia. They're picked to lose by 20 points. And by the way, the number one seed has played the 16th seed in this tournament 135 times. Now I want you to venture a guess. Out of 135 attempts, how many times has the 16th seed beaten the number one seed? Zero. Prior to this week. You know what happened. If you've had to, if you've been, unless you've been living under a rock, you know that the goal, the retrievers, <laughs> that's their, that's their mascot. The retrievers, you talk about underdog. Okay, there's the retrievers. <laughs> they took down the top dog. They beat Virginia. And they didn't just beat them on a last second three point shot. They smoked them. They drubbed them. They embarrassed them. Now, could I ask you a question? How in the world can you take the top flight players on the University of Virginia and pit them against a lower echelon school from a no-name conference, 16th seed retrievers team, and have the retrievers beat the Cavaliers? I'm asking you. How is that explained? I'm going to venture a guess. Just a guess. I'm going to venture this guess. Virginia was overconfident. They said, we got this. Ha <laughs> ha! We got matched up against UMBC. This is going to be a cakewalk. They remind me of Peter. Jesus said, y'all are going to fall away. No, I won't. You're going to deny me. No, I won't. But you know the story, don't you? Dangerous confidence. This morning, I want to ask you, do you have confidence? I'm not asking you if you have confidence in your looks. You know, let's say you're, you're slender, you're chiseled, you have beautiful eyes, and you're just confident, you're cocky because of your looks. I'm not asking that. Or maybe you're super intelligent. And I know I'm talking to a lot of super intelligent people in here. We've got engineers, doctors, uh, teachers, professors. I know that. I'm not asking you if you have confidence in your academic prowess. I'm asking, do you have confidence in your faithfulness to God, your spirituality? You have no grounds for confidence in the flesh. It's a dangerous thing. Now, quickly, let me go to the second scene. And it follows on the heels of his confidence as the night follows the day. It is a collapse. A disheartening collapse. I can imagine it must have dismayed Peter. After all of the bravado, after all of the confidence, after all of the swag, he falls flat on his face. And of course it's a lesson to us all. That when we are confident in our flesh, we surely will fall. Proverbs 16, 18 says this, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You show me someone who's full of themselves, and they're self-confident, and I'll show you someone who is likely to endure a fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 the New Testament echoes that same Old Testament truth. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. If you think you're standing and you think you're all that, be careful because you're on the danger, you're, you're in danger of falling. For example, if I were to say, I've been married to my wife for over 30 years and I've never cheated on my wife. By God's good grace, I've been faithful to her. And I'm never going to betray my wife. I would never run off with a younger woman. 
If I had that attitude in my heart and I I had a, a confidence in my flesh, do you know I would be liable to fall prey to that very temptation? Or maybe some of you are here and you're like, man, I can't believe these drug addicts. I don't know how people get strung out on drugs. I would never be addicted to a substance. I would never be addicted to alcohol or pain pills. This opioid epidemic, I'm above that. No, you're right on the precipice of falling into it. And you can illustrate that with any temptation that we face. It is when we are confident in our flesh that we are most likely to fall. I love what what, uh, the Apostle Paul taught us in Philippians 3.3. He said, put no confidence in the flesh. Know that you can fall. You can be prey to Satan's traps. No, instead, we must put our trust in the Lord. A lot of you know Philippians 1.13. It's, it's one of the best love verses in all the Bible, and, and especially in sports. People love this verse. They put it up on posters. They tape it to their locker. Here's how it goes. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. Some of you know it doesn't end there. That's it. That's the problem. A lot of people think it ends right there. I can do all things, Philippians 4.13. No, that's not what the verse says. The verse says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My strength, have I any, is Jesus in me. If I'm faithful to my wife, it's the Lord Jesus giving me grace to do it. If I stand clear of drugs and alcohol and substance abuse, it's because the Lord Jesus has given me strength to do it. Folks, listen, we are entirely dependent upon the grace and strength of God. Apart from it, we're headed for a total collapse. (laughs) What do you think made Peter collapse? I'm going to give you three things. Now, they're not going to appear on the screen, okay? So you scribble these down in your notes. I'm going to give them to you. They all start with the letter P. You can remember this. What leads to us falling? to a collapse. Three things. Number one, pride. And I've already taught that. When we're proud, we're susceptible to fall. Secondly, prayerlessness. And prayerlessness, listen to this now, guys. Prayerlessness is the fruit of pride. Do you see that? When I believe I got this, I'm, I'm strong enough in my flesh Obviously, I'm not going to pray. I don't need God's help. But when you know you have no strength of your own, you readily fall to your knees and pray. Peter collapsed because he was proud, and Peter collapsed because he didn't pray. Remember, Jesus had taken them into the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, come apart with me and pray. And Peter and the disciples fell asleep. Jesus said, can't you watch with me one hour, can't you? He said, watch and pray that you fall not into temptation for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter needed to pray, but because he was proud, he did not pray. And because he did not pray, he fell. Pride, prayerlessness. Here's the third one, guys. You young people, listen to me. What's the third P? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. Pride, Prayerlessness and peer pressure. Do you know this in the story of Peter? Peter, the Bible says that when Jesus was arrested and carted off, Peter followed him. But there's an expression, three key words. It says, Peter followed him at a distance. At a distance. And you know, distance isn't just physical. Distance is spiritual. You know, you can come to church, dress up real nice, smile, God bless you, and be a million miles away from God in your heart. Man, I look back on my life. I grew up in a great Christian home. I really did. My mom and dad love the Lord to this day. They love and serve him. I have no excuse. But I look back to my teenage years when I went off to college, and I'm ashamed of myself. Ashamed. Now, on the outside, I was relatively close to the Lord. I I attended church. I was active in our youth group. But in my heart, I was following at a distance. And when you follow at a distance, you're prone to a collapse spiritually, especially when when you're surrounded by others who would drag you down. Notice that Peter here has come into the courtyard. He's following Jesus. Got to give him credit. He's there in the courtyard of the high priest's. 
In fact, he's among the soldiers that arrested Jesus. He has a certain level of courage and bravado still. But the Bible says he's standing there warming himself by their fire. Let me tell you young people something. Listen, there's some bonfires you shouldn't go to. Bonfire. All right, there's, there's some bonfires you shouldn't go to. That's from a country song just for you. I'm just <laughs> explaining what I'm doing here. There's some bonfires you ought not go to. There's some parties after the ball game you ought not go to. Because you're going to be pressured by things that are transpiring. And very easily you can be dragged down by it. A little servant girl came. Now remember, Peter had stood down a squadron of Roman legionnaires in the Garden of of Gethsemane. He pulled out his sword. Here's Peter with his little toothpick of a sword facing down a legion, perhaps 600 Roman soldiers. Peter's courageous. But now he stands in front of a little servant girl and she says, are you one of them? No. He's intimidated. He's pressured by the situation in which he finds himself. I'm going to give you guys a statement. I hope you'll jot this down. I like it a lot. I coined it, so I like it. Here it is. (laughs) Peer pressure is not a sin. Peer pressure is a fact. All right, I'm going to say it again. This is, this is really cool. Get this. Peer pressure is not a sin. Peer pressure is a fact. Therefore, use it for your good. How so? Proverbs teaches us, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. If you hang with the wrong crowd, you're going to suffer harm because peer pressure is a fact and it weighs on you and it alters you and it shapes you. Use it for your good. Hang around people that are going to lift you up and encourage you in your spiritual life. And it's not that we're to have no friends with those who don't yet know Christ. To the contrary, Jesus was a friend of sinners and aren't we glad? But I'm saying your heart friends, those with whom you bind your life, Let them be those who lift you up. So there was a total disheartening collapse. Now here's the third scene. And I'm going to call this scene the hinge scene. Because depending on what he does at this juncture determines Peter's future. He has fallen. But the good news is failure need not be final. That doesn't have to be the end of Peter's story. And it's not the end of Peter's story. Because he follows his collapse with what I'm going to call contrition. I want to ask you something today. Have you ever wept for your sin? I remember in college, I was a freshman. And I got involved in something I should not have been involved in. And I won't go into the details of what it was, but I was engrossed in it at that very moment. And something happened to me in that moment. Conviction came over me. And I was not alone. I was was with someone. And I began to weep. And the person who was with me was trying to console me. They said, it's okay, Jeff. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I just wept. I was weeping uncontrollably. And the reason I was weeping is because I was coming face to face with my own sinfulness. Have you ever had contrition? Have you ever been sad for your sin? Well, I'm so glad to tell you Peter was sad. The Bible says that when he had denied the Lord that third time and the rooster crowed, Luke tells us that Jesus looked at him. Jesus was being hauled away to be crucified for our sins. And he looked at Peter, and he must have looked with compassion and tenderness and love. And it broke Peter's heart. The Bible says Peter went out and he wept bitterly. That word in the original language means that he was cut That he was pierced as a knife to his soul. He wept for what he had done. There was contrition. And that's the hinge upon which Peter's life turns. It turns for good. It turns for a future and a hope. 
Not everyone has that response. In fact, in this same story, there's another man. His name's Judas. The truth is, Judas and Peter are not very different from one another. They're really not. They walked with Jesus for three years. They're both part of the apostolic band. Judas is so respected, he's the treasurer. (laughs) But they both denied the Lord in their own unique way, but they both denied the Lord. And the Bible says they both, in effect, wept for what they had done. Judas, do y'all know this? Listen, you may not know this. This is is fascinating. Judas actually, after they carried Jesus away, he came back to the high priest and he said, he said, man, I've, I've betrayed innocent blood. They said, what's that to us? He said, we don't care. Get out of here. And the Bible says Judas threw down the 30 pieces of silver that he had taken as payment for betraying the Lord. I mean, Judas is distraught. Judas is remorseful. But he's not contrite. Because do you know what Judas does? The Bible says he went out and hung himself. He committed suicide. That's why I call this the hinge of history. All of us are failures. We've all blown it. But what determines our future is what we do at that moment of collapse. Are we contrite? Are we repentant? And Peter was, by God's good grace, he repented of his sins. And he's going to turn to a new chapter in his life. And it's the last chapter I'm going to mention. It's what I'm going to call a dynamic comeback. Jesus pardons Peter. And he commissions him afresh. In John 21, which we're going to look at in a couple of weeks, he says, Peter, follow me. He says it afresh and calls him to a new commitment. And Peter begins to follow the Lord again, and he stands up on Pentecost in the presence of the same mob that crucified Jesus, and he preached to them that Jesus, this same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made Lord and Christ. He preaches with all the power and courage anyone has ever mustered, this time not in his own confidence, but confident in the resurrected Lord. And he doesn't cower, and he doesn't back down. In fact, historians tell us that Peter ultimately gave his life for Christ. He was crucified because he wouldn't renounce his faith in Christ. And they tell us Peter asked to be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy, he felt, to be crucified as Jesus was. This is This is Peter. Failure is not final. I want to ask our instrumentalists to come and take their place. In just a moment, we're going to sing together. Comebacks are encouraging, aren't they? And and history's full of great comebacks. There are comebacks in all arenas of life. There are comebacks in sports. One of the, well, it is the greatest comeback in sports uh, NFL history. The Buffalo Bills were playing the Houston Oilers. It was in 1993. They were in a playoff game. And the Bills were behind by 32 points when the second half began. And they came back in overtime and they won that game. Until today, that game is called the comeback. And by the way, it was led by a backup quarterback. He wasn't even the starter. His name was Frank Reich. He came back, and his team came back. And by the way, that same uh, backup quarterback, Frank Reich, this year was one of the coaches for the Philadelphia Eagles who won the Super Bowl. And he is a pastor. He pastors a local church all the while he coaches. Super story. What a comeback! But it's not just in sports. How about in politics? This is a very famous example, but it's the story of Abraham Lincoln. A lot of you know Abraham Lincoln grew up on the frontier. And uh, he, he started a couple of businesses, and both of them went belly up. He was a failure. And he went through what a lot of people believe was a mental breakdown. Then he ran for Congress, and he lost. Then he ran for Senate twice and lost both times. Then he was the vice presidential candidate on a presidential ticket and they lost. He failed again and again and again, but he came back. 
and became our 16th president, and many believe the greatest president we've ever had. You see, failure is not final. Sports or in politics, in business, but most of all, spiritually. I know I'm talking to failures. Y'all not mad at me for saying that, are you? We have failed, have we not? We failed. I wonder right now, what is the failure in your life? Where is it that you're in effect saying, I don't know him? And you're denying him. I've got good news for you. He's looking at you. And he says, I've got a future for you. And I've got a hope. Failure is not final. Let's stand. In just a moment, we're going to sing. Has the Holy Spirit put His finger on where it is you're failing? Where it is you're caught in sin? Would you just confess that to Him? Would you cry out and say, Lord, I put no confidence in my flesh. Lord, I'm not able. I'm dependent upon you. Cry out to him. Ask him to forgive you. Ask for him to give you a heart of repentance so that that hinge can turn and you can walk through the door to the future he has. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, for the hope that it gives us that our failings are not final, but that in you, there's a bright new day dawning. Help us, Lord, to step into it, to repent of our sins and to trust in your grace and mercy. I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.